Hello. Okay. So welcome back after the coffee break. Uh, my name is uh, Iman Sliagis, uh, uh, former ambassador, former minister of defense of Latvia, and it's a pleasure for me to uh, moderate uh, this uh, panel. And uh, this uh, discussion is now really part of a side event that is moving into the Riga uh, Security Forum 2021, which is uh, a forum that is organized annually by the Latvian Institute of International Affairs, where I'm a senior fellow. And uh, uh, the forum this year has been really organized by way of a, a series of podcasts, which I'd uh, encourage you to have a look at. They've been uh, recorded since uh, October, and they began with uh, an inter interview with the president of Latvia, uh, Egil Slevitz, and obviously fo focusing on uh, uh, current security problems. Um, so, um, having heard from uh, the NATO Secretary General this morning, two ministers uh, of foreign affairs from Southern Europe, and a very experienced Estonian colleague, uh, former Minister of Defence and uh, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, who's now the uh, NATO permanent, uh, the Estonian permanent representative at uh, NATO, uh, we're now moving on to uh, uh, two sets of discussions uh, with a group of experts. Uh, uh, and this first discussion will be on the topic of emerging threats and challenges and how to enhance NATO's 360-degree approach. And uh, we're extremely uh, lucky to have four uh, talented participants to take part in the discussion, and I'd just like to introduce them uh, very quickly. First of all, we have uh, James uh, Apaturai, uh, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary General for Emerging uh, Security Challenges. James is a Canadian uh, national who has been at NATO since 1998 and is, of course, very well known uh, with a wide experience of the NATO Brussels bubble. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> next to him, uh, uh, Lauren uh, Speranza. She is the Director of Transatlantic Defence and Security at the Centre for European Policy Analysis. And prior to that, she was a Deputy Director at the Transant Transatlantic Security Initiative at the Atlantic Council, where uh, Lauren has focused on uh, Nordic-Baltic security, Europe's southern neighbourhood and NATO future. And a special welcome to Lauren because this is her first trip to Riga and she's come over ac across the Atlantic to join us, so we're very grateful for that. Two wonderful online participants, Benoit Daboville, former French uh, ambassador, uh, including at NATO, we, where we were privileged to work together. And uh, Benoit is now vice president of the Fondation des Etudes Stratégiques in Paris and is a professor at uh, Sciences Po in Paris. And last but certainly not least, uh, Professor Julian Lindley French, a good friend of Latvia, chairman of the Alphen Group, amongst other things, and the author of an excellent book written together with General John Allen and uh, General Ben Hodges, uh, addressing future war and the defense of Europe, and indeed uh, addressing many of the topics that we'll be discussing today. So, uh, from the program, you'll see that we've outlined a broad range of topics relating to emerging threats and challenges, and in particular, how they can be re reconciled with the core tasks uh, of the Alliance. Uh, and I'd just like to remind the speakers that we're going to start with an introduction of five to seven minutes of, uh, by each speaker, and then we'll uh, move into questions, and I'd encourage questions from the audience afterwards. So, James, uh, starting with you, you're a great NATO insider. Uh, so, how would you define emerging security challenges, and uh, how do you think they'll be dealt with in the new strategic concept? Over to you. So, th thanks for that introduction, and thanks for being here. I liked how you said I had wide experience in the Brussels bubble. I'm not sure that was a <laughs> wide experience. Uh, but I, I have been at NATO uh, a long time, as you also noted. Uh, and I'm, I mean, I'm really pleased that we're, we're spending time on this topic today. I think collective defense and the sort of more longstanding roles of NATO were extensively addressed in the first part of this conference. But, you know, I, I just 
moved to this division, Emerging Security Challenges, uh, about 10 or 11 weeks ago. And I, I went home, and when I was told what I would be doing, I went home and told my, my kids that I would be <laughs> working on cybersecurity and emerging and disruptive technologies like artificial intelligence and on the security implications of climate change. And then my, my son said, well, finally, you're doing something useful. <laughs> and, but I, when, I, when I thought about it, I thought, well, actually, if you're 14, that's true. Um, these are the challenges they feel they're going to be facing uh, in future. So I'm really glad that, that the whole alliance is, is focusing more and more on these issues. So let me just address how I, I see, uh, I used to say from down in the coal room, but considering climate change, I can't say that anymore. So <laughs> from downstairs, uh, how we might be addressing some of these issues. First is to say that the new strategic concept, I think, will quite clearly have much more prominent roles for uh, all of these issues, cyber, uh, emerging and disruptive technologies, uh, climate change. These were one-liners in the uh, old strategic concept that made sense at the time. Uh, now it doesn't, as well as hybrid uh, defense, which was discussed extensively this morning. And you know, you talked about how these fit into the new, or into the, to the core tasks, and they run across all the core tasks. Mm -hmm. To preserve our security, to defend our values when it comes to collective defense, when it comes to operations, when it comes to a global perspective, as the Secretary General highlighted this morning, all of these are cross-cutting. But they're really different, and I think you know everybody sees this, from the way in which we have seen collective defense in particular, or, and addressing more traditional threats in the past. Uh, I mean, in the old days, and even now when it comes to, to more sort of heavy metal defense, there's a line, behind that line you're secure, you build up heavy defenses and you hope that nothing crosses the line into your territory. When it comes to these challenges, there's persistent competition all the time. It's happening every day. There's no line, it's transnational, and they're already here. So we really need to conceptualize in a very different way. So let me address uh, all three of these issues very quickly. One is cyber. We've come a long way in NATO on cyber. Uh, a key point is resilience, building up the resilience of our system. So NATO has set baselines already uh, for uh, greater resilience, and there's an, an active discussion about 5G, for example. Uh, we need to ensure, from a NATO point of view in particular, that the critical infrastructure of allies, including for reinforcement, but not just for, for military mobility, like our power systems, like uh, the functioning of government, uh, like our ports and airfields, they need to be secured. Uh, so the allies are working on that, and I hope that we will continue to raise the baseline as we approach uh, the uh, summit, and this will certainly be enshrined as a principle, I think, in the, uh, in the strategic concept. Second is, advanced technologies, artificial intelligence, uh, data, autonomous weapons. So there's two issues here. One is we have to, we say, keep our military edge, and I think in most cases we, we still do have a military edge, but not all. Uh, that requires investment in research and development. It also means working much more closely with industry and different industry than we used to work with, and that means, for example, startups. So if you're China, China has a policy called civil military fusion. Every private sector company, if it has dual use technologies, has to make those technologies available to the state. All data that passes through Chinese companies' servers is available to the state by law. They don't have a choice. We have a lot of distance between the private sector and the public sector, especially when it comes to smart ups and, smart, and small companies. We have to change the way we do business and engage with them, get them to trust us uh, more than they do, but also to think about defense requirements. The Secretary General mentioned our Defense Innovation Accelerator uh, that uh, ministers will be discussing uh, today. So we're putting that in place to engage with the startup community uh, and hopefully bring them closer uh, to us. We can discuss that more if you want, but it's to keep our edge. The second thing, we have to do when it comes to uh, emerging technologies like AI and data is to fight the values fight. Mm -hmm. So what's happening, uh, and I'll, get, I'll use China as an example. 
China is, as we all know, using technology to reinforce autocracy at home. The epicenter of that is Xinjiang, but that's being rolled out across China. They call it smart cities. Uh, but it's all about tracking your citizens and controlling their politics and their movements and how they spend money and everything. But that's not just China. China's also exporting uh, surveillance technology, artificial intelligence, facial recognition, gate recognition, the way you walk, uh, to autocratic states in Europe, in Latin America, and in Africa. And it is demonstrably, statistically, measurably reinforcing the longevity of autocracies. So up until 2000, the year 2000, autocracies lasted around 10 years on average. Since 2000, when all this technology started to roll out, they are lasting 25 years on average. And the countries that use surveillance technology the most last the longest and have the shortest protests. We, this is all measured, it's all Freedom House, you can go and look at it. Uh, and China is at the forefront of reinforcing this. And then the third knock-on effect is this growing community of autocracies votes together in the international bodies that set standards, for example, on 5G or 6G right now at the International Telecommunications Union. So on the standards, but also the leadership of these bodies. So we need to organize ourselves to preserve our values through the systems and technologies on which they depend. Open, free internet, for example. Final point, climate, and then I'll stop talking. Right, good. Got it. <laughs> uh, and we can come back to climate if you wish, but I, I just want to say that NATO will address climate seriously, uh, including in the strategic concept, to be the place where we lead on the assessing the security implications of climate change, adapting our forces to deal with them, and also doing our best to improve efficiency so that maybe we can contribute to reducing what our forces put out as well. And all of this requires more cooperation with the EU and industry, both of which will be in the strategic concept, and now I will stop. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks very much for taking us through cyber, uh, advanced technology, and a few words on climate. And uh, it's good that uh, advanced technology uh, is understood by your 14-year-old son. <laughs> uh, so uh, I think it's very important that uh, NATO does explain these fairly complex issues uh, to, to our publics. Uh, uh, Lauren, uh, about a year ago, you wrote something in Defence News uh, making some proposals uh, uh, about what NATO could do on, on, on a number of these issues. And uh, James has already touched on the importance of uh, the cooperation uh, on advanced technology with, uh, uh, with the private sector, with industry. Uh, you might want to take uh, expand on that a bit more. But you also, me also mentioned the way in which these issues can be dealt with uh, between NATO and the European Union. So uh, perhaps you'd like to say a few words on, on these topics. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for, for having me. I'm really honored to be joining this distinguished panel. Um, and I, I have to say, I'm, I'm so glad, James, that you spent such a significant amount of time talking about all the work that NATO is doing on emerging tech and innovation, because uh, I think this is an area where NATO really ought to be commended for prioritizing this and recognizing the critical nature that our tech edge plays in not just collective defense, but the wider strategic competition uh, between the West and China and Russia. Um, Imans, to your question, I, I think NATO, to its credit and to the credit of James's team, um, they have, uh, NATO has done quite a bit of work, um, especially in line with some of the suggestions and types of efforts that I outlined in that article, um, including through NATO's new EDT strategy, through NATO's AI strategy, through the efforts uh, like Diana and the NATO Innovation Fund that we discussed this morning. Um, and I think Diana, in particular, as you mentioned, James, will get at some of the industry engagement issues by working with startups and maintaining um, a network of those to help meet NATO's technology needs. I think we still have some work to do on kind of contracting mechanisms and making sure we're more flexible and agile and can actually uh, identify the right types of tech solutions and doing more continuous horizon scanning uh, to know what's out there that can meet our needs. Um, uh, but I think the NATO Innovation Fund is a great initiative. I think there's 17 nations already participating and more expected to come. So this is all just to say that um, I think this relatively quick progress, I mean, we were just talking about this a, a, about a year ago and look at all of the action that's already happened. I think that's to be commended. 
But I think NATO's in this critical phase now of trying to, to figure out how to best implement and drive forward some of these initiatives. And um, from my view, where I sit on the outside, I think there's a bit of a debate going on about NATO's precise role in this and whether it should seek to be more of a, a developer of technology or kind of a, a curator or an enabler of technologies. And um, NATO, of course, brings considerable benefits to the table to help small nations and large nations work together and pull resources on tech, but there's still a lot of sticky issues that we're working through um, and hesitation among allied nations to share some of the requisite intellectual property and key data that allows us to kind of successfully co-develop tech. So in the meantime, I think NATO has a huge value add in uh, focusing on uh, standardization of technologies and facilitating the adoption and integration of these capabilities across the alliance. And I think we should be more actively even driving this through our, our NATO defense planning process and our capability targets. And, and that indeed is an area that is ripe for more cooperation with the European Union on its capability processes and tech standards and its investment incentives as well. Uh, and I know uh, that is well recognized by, mm -hmm. by the folks at NATO. But I thought, um, I would just round off here with kind of three humble recommendations, and I'm sure, James, these are things that, that you and your team are working on, but kind of as an, as an expert from the outside, I think uh, our, our tech strategies, both at the NATO level and at the national level, tend to focus on technology themselves too much. Um, and I think uh, we, what we really need to do is think about the desired effect we're trying to create and identify specific use cases based on concrete operational needs. And um, and I think there's, there's some of that in, in, in our NATO documents, including in, in the AI strategy, for example. Um, but the key is really about pulling together a, a bunch of technologies to create a kind of uh, a, a new capability. And, and I think we need to do more mainstreaming of that kind of thinking across the work of Diana and the NATO Innovation Fund so that we don't just stock the shelves with technology for technology's sake and kind of fall subject to a shiny object syndrome, you know, really making sure that we're uh, we're on the same page about what we're trying to achieve. And that actually helps us uh, not only better align our, our funding pipelines, but also achieve faster adoption because we know what we're working toward. Um, and then I, I would say, secondly, I think NATO can probably do even more to, to improve our interoperability and standardization. Um, interoperability, of course, is key to make sure our capabilities and technologies can uh, talk to each other and nations can plug in their capabilities to fight together. Um, but right now, as I understand it, you know, only kind of uh, NATO operational headquarters have any kind of external system to sort of verify their interoperability and nations just kind of acknowledge the guidance that they've received from NATO, but there's no way to sort of really uh, determine that they have, these standards have been implemented. So trying to empower uh, some type, you know, monitoring committees that might exist already or other kind of authorities to help ensure that standards are implemented, I think would be helpful in my view. I think we also have a, a sufficient focus on operational standards, but not enough on materiel standards. So trying to develop those in more places along the defense tech supply chains. And then finally, of course, to your point about China, um, making sure that allies aren't using uh, Chinese-made software or equipment uh, or components in our equipment that could create vulnerabilities or impede allies' willingness to plug in. And then last, um, I would say we probably still have some work to do to determine how the new NATO uh, tech-related structures fit with the existing uh, structures and authorities. So for example, how do Diana and the NATO Innovation Fund fit with uh, NATO's innovation hub at ACT? Um, or the, the NIAG, the NATO Industrial Advisory Group, or this, the Conference of National Armaments Directors um, that typically have, have a role in, in these types of issues. And I know that's something that, that NATO is working on. But I think it's a problem that goes beyond NATO because there are so many innovation uh, type initiatives that are popping up across the transatlantic community, which is great, but we wanna make sure that these efforts are not fragmented and that they're actually mutually reinforcing. And I think we also wanna challenge ourselves to kind of use to do better with what we have uh, in some places where we can. Um, there are a handful of other things that we can get into um, with respect to fixing the regulatory environment and, and uh, trying to in increase the risk appetite of governments to really do innovation and work with non-traditional partners to improve trust for better data sharing. Uh, but again, some oh, of these things need yeah. to be done outside uh, of the NATO framework. Um, 
in cooperation with nations and the EU. So I'll stop there for now. Okay, great. Thanks very much. You've uh, come forward with some concrete proposals, and I think that's excellent. We've, uh, we're developing the uh, NATO uh, acronym slightly, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, uh, let's just uh, uh, focus on some of the uh, more broad terms. And uh, 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 Benoit, uh, to bring you in now from Paris, uh, uh, you uh, very kindly also contributed to a publication uh, that was produced in Latvia last year, uh, uh, which dealt with the technical, uh, te technological challenges that China poses to the United States and, uh, uh, and what NATO's role can be as a platform in managing uh, transatlantic cooperation. Uh, we've already touched on this slightly with, with our first two speakers. Uh, uh, but on the question of the technology, of course, uh, there was an issue on submarine technology recently, uh, which indicated that NATO didn't really play any, any coordinating or cooperative role. So do you think that there is uh, room for NATO to do more in getting all 30 allies uh, to cooperate on uh, technological advances? And as uh, Lauren mentioned, uh, uh, what do we need to do to, uh, to focus on what can be achieved? Benoit, I hope that uh, we'll be able to hear you. Yeah, Iman, it is, uh, I am glad to see you uh, again, and I thank you for your presentation. Uh, you are completely right. The discussion about technology is basically uh, about uh, uh, the right of China and what we do with it. Uh, as, an, uh, as uh, an alliance, and there will be uh, new strategic concepts, uh, a lot of development. But my, my point is, really, we should not forget about all all the other aspects of the role of allies. Uh, we have been, uh, of course, there has been a great relief about the end of the Trump. Uh, Iraq, um, and we are glad that it has got that the 25 year uh, duration of the democracy mentioned by, uh, by Denis. Uh, but everybody knows that uh, uh, we will not go back to the golden years of uh, the 70s and the 80s. Uh, we are living in a completely different uh, world. And, and, uh, I, I will stress uh, four points. Uh, the first one is uh, the fact that our main ally, the US, is uh, totally focused uh, on the challenge of China. And that, uh, uh, that doesn't mean that it forgets about the European, but uh, uh, it, as Biden said uh, in Rome uh, recently, on the side of even for the president, um, there is a a willingness to have a new approach to the burden sharing and to let uh, and ask the European to, to do more, including in all the new uh, challenge space of uh, fiber, fiber uh, and new technology. So my first uh, interrogation is uh, given the, the difficulty we have with the American, with ITA, with uh, uh, the geographic barrier between uh, or transatlantic uh, technology producer, how we will deal with uh, those uh, aspects. Um, and as uh, Biden is asking more to the European, uh, I will have uh, the question of, for example, what is the position of, uh, of NATO? Uh, there will be, uh, of course, uh, Lots of florid uh, language about uh, uh, the cooperation between the two institutions. But, uh, for example, is Diana a NATO response to the European defense spend? Uh, is there a, how, is, will, is there a, a kind of competition? My second point is that the nuclear uh, factor remains the uh, ultimate challenge to the international. Uh, politics. Uh, proliferation is uh, getting uh, worse. Uh, 
nobody knows about the Iranian unification, but uh, uh, we, we see that uh, uh, de facto the, the U.S. are resigned to North Korea proliferation. And uh, there are good news, like the, the German coalition agreement, uh, which uh, about uh, nuclear sharing, but we still have a lot of uh, problems with uh, uh, the nuclear culture, with, uh, the, with the action of the people who support the nuclear ban. And the third uh, aspect, we have, uh, as has been said, we have identified in NATO a lot of uh, uh, new challenge, and I would say that uh, for me the first one is space, because Probably that the enemy uh, direct confrontation, military confrontation, will start with uh, uh, space uh, destruction from assets. Uh, we are uh, we are seeing uh, now to extend to, to which the hybrid uh, war is uh, is used by our competitor. Uh, cyber is a problem not only for the military but for every industry and services in the world. So the problem is how NATO could embrace all those uh, issues without losing its core function to be a kind or to be a, a, a kinetic military alliance and not a kind of uh, uh, forum for a discussion about everything from climate to technology and resiliency. Uh, I think that uh, there is a risk that, uh, which is very apparent in the report of NATO 2030 of uh, the alliance becoming really, really political rather than military. And uh, the last point is, of course, uh, how everything will be paid by NATO. Uh, it's uh, we, we, know, we know the difficulty uh, of uh, of nation to to pay uh, to pay their bill, uh, and uh, we don't want to have new task uh, really uh, threatening uh, the, the improvement in military spending within the country of Malawi. Unfortunately, the, the, the sound quality wasn't too good, but uh, uh, I mean, I, what I picked up, I think in particular, you, one of your last points was uh, uh, how to embrace these uh, emerging challenges and uh, uh, how they knock into the core function. And also, uh, I, I think your comments were very pertinent about uh, uh, Biden uh, seeking Europeans to do more on these issues, especially on the hyper issues. Uh, so Julian, uh, great to see you, and uh, one of the theses of your book addresses the impact of emerging technologies on future warfare and the profound implications on European defence. Uh, but um, I was intrigued, you also had a chapter focusing on Southern Europe and indeed the question of uh, 360 degree Europe. And, uh, and so what I'd ask you to address, because this is part of our discussion uh, is, could you say something more about Europeans needing to reconcile uh, the threats beyond Russia, uh, which is, of course, pertinent for our southern partners? Can't hear you at the moment. We've got a technical problem because we need to hear Julian. No, you have a me yeah. problem, but I didn't have That's, mute. You, you, you were on mute, were you? I was on mute. It's right. the problem of old men with new technology. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, but anyway, okay. great to be with you, Imitz, and uh, great to be with uh, Lauren James and Benoit, directly from my deepest, darkest Dutch den, which my Dutch wife rather unfairly calls the swamp, for, for reasons I can't understand. Um, James, I like your idea of smart-ups. I will use that. Uh, I think NATO needs smart reach out to smart startups because in a conversation with a friend of mine who's a, a company director of a, an artificial in, an intelligence company in the US, 
he told me that he almost gave up on NATO because it was so slow and did not operate at the same rate of business. So it's good to hear that in your division, you're starting to address this. Uh, and it won't only require you to engage with these companies. And I'm willing to put you in touch with, uh, with this friend of mine. But also the way they do business. There's, there's a cultural shift also, also required. But thanks for your question, Nimitz. And, and let me address this um, directly because it's, it's central to the thesis in this new book of mine, Future War and the Defense of Europe, which is brilliant and very reasonably priced, and I fully recommend it. Um, but we need to understand the interaction of all the threats Europeans face. And we do tend to get fixated, depending on one's preference, in a certain strategic direction. But it is the interaction of those threats, strategic, geopolitical, regional, domestic, and technological, which is, to my mind, the essential challenge that NATO's facing, and therefore the essential challenge of the forthcoming strategic concept, the, the what, the where, the why, the how, with what, with whom, and for what end of the alliance. If our alliance is to credibly balance the ends, ways, and means of deterrence and defense with that of security, engagement, outreach, and partnership, whilst doing so, as the threat and technology landscape changes. This is a moving feast that the Alliance is having to deal with. It's also a global landscape, and I'm very much in sympathy with much of what Benoit said, because this will create such tensions in US foreign security and defense policy. And to my mind, stretch American forces to such an extent that the central tenet of European defense since 1945 can no longer be assumed that US forces of sufficient strength will always be present in Europe in all circumstances. And that means, in other words, that we Europeans are going to have to do far more for our own security and defense across that security and defense spectrum if the Americans are to maintain their security guarantees through the alliance to Europe across the full spectrum of missions, which when I hear the conversations like the one we're having today, that spectrum gets wider every day. Uh, and we're going to have to mean our ability to engage that. And at the very least, that will mean more European strategic responsibility. You can call it autonomy, whatever you like, but I prefer strategic responsibility for both for the sake of both European security and defense and the transatlantic relationship. This is simply the strategic inflection point we are at. And, and we Europeans are going to have to do far more. Now, that's particularly important for the systemic instability faced by our allies in Southern Europe. So let me address that issue of the Middle East and North Africa. And I think it's first important to separate regional crises from a wider, more systemic challenge that is, in the, is, a, is apparent in MENA. The challenges and threats to Southern Europe are part of globalized systemic change, demographic change, climate change, and a mass mega trend shift of peoples from rural life to urban life and across countries and continents as people become aware of a more secure life elsewhere. And many of them seek it, enabled sadly all too often by growing transnational organized crime networks leading to the kind of tragedy we saw in the in the English Channel this last week. As a privileged migrant myself, living in the Netherlands, I understand that motivation. I go where I can get work and a better life. However, it is the interaction between systemic change and regional crises, which is placing NATO South in particular on a new front line of instability and making European societies in general ever more vulnerable to uh, both geopolitical and a kind of ideological manipulation via what I call the five Ds of perma-warfare. Disinformation, deception, destabilization, disruption, and coercion via implied or actual destruction. As James said, quite rightly, there is no neat uh, dividing line between defense and no defense anymore, between security and defense. It's, it's merging and the alliance must cope with it. And across MENA itself, there are social and political instabilities that have worsened with the emergence of the state versus anti-state Salafist jihadism, further exacerbated by the problems of COVID-19, with potentially profound implications for Southern Europe and, and the rest of Europe. 
there's also the prospect of a major regional strategic war. Um, Iran's hardline stance over its nuclear program is is becoming a major problem. One only has to look at what is happening in Vienna at this very moment to understand that, allied to the emergence of regional strategic blocs across the Middle East, which are being exacerbated by external geopolitical interference. And then it all comes back to Europeans because there's also the constant threat of disrupted energy security, particularly in Libya, which threatens not only to cut off your uh, vital oil and gas supplies, but extend Europe's reliance on and thus vulnerability to Russian influence and coercion. It's all interlinked and we have to see it in the round in the total and in, in its totality. And then there is the rise of China, which for my mind is the biggest single geopolitical change factor to impact Europeans' defense since 1945. And whilst the US has long been a, a European actor, China is fast becoming one. China is a kind of Jekyll and Hyde power, both constructive and invasive. And we have to be very clear about the distinction between the two, because the Chinese Communist Party are nothing if not control freaks. And whilst the threat to China, for China's threat to Europe is indirect at present, its impact on Europe's future defense could be as profound as Russia's post COVID 19 if wolf warrior diplomacy and debt diplomacy are combined to ill effect. This is particularly the case in southern and parts of Eastern Europe, where Chinese and I might add Russian money are having an effect, particularly in the, in the Balkans and parts of the Eastern uh, Mediterranean. And to conclude, let me address a third set of threats, technology, and whether the alliance, and particularly we Europeans, fully grasp the extent in which the character of, and conduct of warfare is changing. Uh, European allies in particular really need to, to grip this. If deterrence is to remain credible, Europe's future, future defense will also need to be credible in all potential worst cases, chronic overstretch, the application of merging, emerging and disruptive technologies in the battle space. And, and my concern is that too often we Europeans fudge that for sake of cost or the short term, a lack of uh, long term strategic planning, because by 2030, uh, I am firm in my belief that Europeans will need a defense that reaches from seabed to space, from open space to urban space, uh, open or uh, uh, urban warfare, and across the multi domains of air, sea, land, cyberspace, information, and knowledge. And that will require a host of new partnerships in Europe, not just across the Atlantic, particularly a radical strategic public private partner uh, sector partnership. If we are to develop the systems and platforms across the artificial intelligence, hypersonic technologies, super and quantum computing et al, which will increasingly inform deterrence and defense. And whilst the EU, which is vital to this, is making progress, I still see the European defense and technological industrial base as being far too uh, uh, limited and linked to national industrial and employment policies rather than the future of, of European defense. So to conclude, what is our test of seriousness? Well, it's the strategic concept. It must be by its very definition. What I want to see in it, and, and James uh, will, will know better than I do, is irrespective of US policy choices that are coming, the beating military heart of Europe's future war defense will need to be European. What we need at the very least is a new US interoperable, high-end first responder NATO European force, which is capable of sufficient maneuver that it can reinforce deterrence. And I'm concerned that we have a deterrence hole in, in Central Eastern Europe, which is encouraging Russians to make a potential error of judgment and of sufficient capacity and mass to support our frontline states in the South in the face of systemic instability. In, in the Alfam Group's just completed NATO shadow strategic concept, which we published in January by several think tanks, we call this force the AMHF or Allied Command Operations Heavy Mobile Force. It would build on the, the NATO readiness initiative, would be EU available at the core of a new comprehensive European security and defense concept and underpin the NATO 2030 agenda. And it would also help, and I think this is crucial, whether it's engaging deterrence and defense 
or longer-term security engagement by establishing more equitable transatlantic burden sharing of both cost and risk, because crucially, it would afford Europeans more strategic responsibility within the alliance framework and strengthen the all-important NATO-EU strategic partnership. If, if, the, if the strategic concept does not hit all these, these targets, the 360-degree defence, seabed to space, greater European strategic responsibility, the new technological battle space, and how to generate it, then I fear it will be a political document dressed up as a strategic one. And if that is the case, it will fail. Thank you, Emits. OK, thanks very much. It's, I think it was very useful uh, to bring us back to the strategic concept and uh, you know, what the main priorities will be, whether it will be submerged by new technologies uh, uh, and blurred, uh, which would perhaps blur the main concern of uh, collective de defence and deterrence, which uh, Julian just referred to. Um, I don't know whether we have uh, any questions yet from the audience. Please don't hesitate to raise your hand. Uh, if uh, Yes, uh, over there. Uh, the, uh, uh, good, uh, the, the, the next moderator, um, Reinhard Krumm from the uh, Friedrich Ebert uh, Stiftung, who are also, of course, a partner, an important partner in the uh, uh, Riga Security Forum. So. Please, uh, Reinhard. Uh, warming up. Uh, yeah. The question is towards James, if I may. Um, we're talking a lot also on this panel about cooperation, strategic thinking between the EU and NATO. I just came back from a kind of uh, think tank meeting, um, EU uh, defense strategy. And people from Brussels were telling me that there is very little cooperation or exchange of opinions and expertise between the strategic um, or the strategy process of NATO and the strategic compass. And of course, now you're smiling, you know this. Um, <laughs> the question is, um, why is that? I mean, if we on the one hand side would like to see more cooperation, we just heard from um, the last expert that uh, security in Europe will be more shouldered by Europe, then it would, you know, the question is why not already trying to be more cooperative, especially in strategic matters? Uh, the question is to James, but maybe anybody else would like to answer. Go ahead. Thanks. Okay, so perhaps I can just yeah. add to that because uh, I understand that there are uh, uh, moves afoot to have a joint. Uh, uh, NATO and European Union uh, declaration about the strategic concept and the strategic compass. And I think these days in Latvia, actually, we've seen a, a very concrete, uh, very concrete evidence of NATO working very closely with uh, uh, the European Union uh, with the visit uh, of the Secretary General with uh, the President of the Commission, uh, Ursula uh, von der Leyen, who, you know, and this was mentioned by the Secretary General this morning, and I think this is an extremely positive message that's coming out from both organizations. Uh, but, uh, James, uh, perhaps you can... So, um, I, I don't think it's as bad as it might look. Um, <laughs> For, for a few reasons. One is we have had now two joint declarations already, which between the two organizations have set you know, some pretty coherent uh, lanes in which we have pursued work. And as you know very well, there's 72 areas in which we're, we're working together. And we're working on a third uh, joint declaration as well, uh, which of course brings coherence between the two organizations. Then uh, we've had an innumerable series of what we call cross briefings. So commissioners come to NATO, we send our assistant secretaries general, and of course the secretary general regularly at DSG as well, over there. So over time, we've sort of tried to ensure that we have a common understanding of each other's directions of travel, and, and the secretary general at his level has of course discussed these documents with the leadership at the EU. And then the final point I would make on that point is now, especially on the EU side, we're not quite there with the strategic concept, but the strategic compass is a little bit earlier in time. And it's going to nation states, member states of the EU, uh, a majority of which are NATO member states. And they have said in both buildings in Brussels, 
that they intend to ensure coherence between the two documents. So I, I'm actually reasonably confident that we'll get there. And when you look at the draft of the strategic compass, which I understand is publicly available online, uh, maybe not the intention of the EU, but it was soon <laughs> out there, um, you can see that the themes, at least I found it quite reassuring, that the themes that the uh, EU colleagues before going to nations have chosen as priorities are extremely coherent with what NATO is doing. So, you know, we work inside our, our staffs to produce first drafts. Once it goes to allies uh, and member states, I'm, I'm pretty confident that based on all the work we've done until now, it should mesh reasonably well. Lauren, do you want to come in and add anything to, to what James has said? Um, maybe just a very quick two finger. I mean, I think James, that makes a ton of sense. And, and I, I think we've seen the NATO EU relationship certainly moving in the right direction and, and lots of really powerful signals in progress. Uh, Iman, as you mentioned this week with the joint visit. Um, I think of course there are, you know, practical issues such as information sharing and classification issues and some of those kind of bureaucratic struggles that can continue to be um, an issue in some ways. But I, I will say when you talk to folks, there is a lot of examples of kind of very practical staff to staff coordination that happens a lot between the two organizations. And then I think there's a lot of um, political cooperation at the top level between, for example, the Secretary General and his counterparts. But I think there's probably a lot of things in between that we can do between the bottom staff to staff level to the tippy top levels of our political leaders. Um, and I hope that the next joint declaration will give us more impetus to take advantage of, of those kinds of efforts in between. Okay, good. Thanks very much. Uh, I don't see... Ah, there's a question further down there. Yeah. Hello. Perhaps introduce yeah. yourself. And um, I'm Adam Skazlowski, a student at Regis Radnich University. Great, yeah. Uh, I have a question regarding China in regards to infrastructure and cybersecurity. Uh, we see that uh, Montenegro, a NATO member state, currently has deep issues with uh, its uh, ability to repay Chinese loans. Mm. And uh, at the same time, we see also Lithuania raising concerns about uh, the investments and especially cybersecurity, where it uh, urged its uh, citizens not to use Xiaomi products. Uh, so therefore, my question is this, um, should NATO unify, use a more unified, assertive approach uh, towards China, or should it look for a more different slash complex approach? And if so, what would be the general character? characteristics of it. Thank you. Okay, that's a very good question. Thank you very much. Perhaps we'll, uh, Benoit, could we perhaps return to you for a brief answer to this and then, and then Julian, perhaps you want to chip in as we've had our two uh, uh, first panelists already answer the first question. Yeah. I think the, the first question is, can we use a really decouple in a global world economy, uh, China, from us, without uh, paying an extraordinary cost? Um, I, am, I am skeptical. Uh, it was easy to decouple the USSR from uh, our economy, because the uh, USSR was weak, were, was, uh, and uh, we had the, the COCOM, and the COCOM was working more or less so. But China is a different issue. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't really see how you can, uh, NATO, for example, establish a new COCOM on uh, Chinese uh, technology. My, my second point is uh, that uh, uh, technology uh, uh, are now really uh, developing from uh, private sector uh, investors and so forth. They, they don't like the bureaucracies. And uh, so uh, the really to create new bureaucracy, to foster uh, technology within uh, NATO, uh, I have doubt. Uh, in NATO, you have a very different level of technology amongst the various allies. Uh, 
I think France is, uh, uh, for, for example, in, in space and cyber is uh, really uh, at, uh, uh, at, a, at a good level, but, but some other uh, country uh, are not able to, to spend the money for that. So uh, who will pay? Third uh, aspect, the US has immense resource and they can invest in various technological lane, even if that doesn't succeed. Uh, for example, they have spent 10 billion a year on missile defense with uh, results which are uh, really not uh, ordinary uh, convincing. Meanwhile, the, the, the Russian find the way uh, with supersonic to, to, be, to beat uh, um, those defense. But uh, the European uh, are not able to invest uh, uh, on project and then to, uh, to find a closed door or to find an impasse. They need to prioritize very much their investment. And uh, therefore, there is a different aspect uh, on the process of the US way to deal with technology and the European. And I think that reconciliating those two means that uh, there will be a lot of work to, to do, including very simple things like uh, the, the kind of uh, the ITAR, ITAR uh, process, which prohibit um, uh, exchange or, or make them uh, difficult. The, the key issue for NATO is interoperability rather than uh, uh, Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Julian, before I bring you in, James just wanted to uh, have a, a, a quick uh, comment. Well, just to, to offer an answer to the question. We have to offer alternatives, uh, meaning good technology mm. at a reasonable price, because otherwise countries that don't have the resources don't have options. I was with a Nigerian yeah. colleague uh, a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, who said Nigeria is going to be buying Chinese mm. technology. And he said, it's cheap and it's good and no one's giving us anything cheaper yeah. or anything better. So sure. that's the first thing. And second, we have to be political in providing resources for alternatives. So the EU took a courageous decision to provide, uh, basically to pay back a loan uh, for a country in the Western Balkans. It couldn't pay back to China, but it was for strategic reasons that the mm. EU did that. So we need to be political in our investments as well. Okay. This is not just about industry. Very good point, James, thanks. Uh, um, Julian, any comments, uh, any answers to this question? Uh, unmute yeah, yourself. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm, oh, I, was, I was muted by the host, which is probably a very good idea, but... Uh, um, um, First, on, the, on NATO EU, look, we have to move beyond themes. We have to start doing practical issues now. The EU will be vital to resilience uh, of the home base. Uh, there are areas like overcoming legal blockages that prevent rapid use and movement of militaries across our borders that the EU can play a big role in for military mobility, um, as well as a host of, of, of critical infrastructure activities. If we can't protect the home base, then NATO's credibility as a, as a deterrence power projector will be undermined. On China, we mustn't emnify China. At the same time, we have to be realistic about China, the nature of it. And I, for me, to, to mix my metaphors, I think the most important thing is we preserve the strategic autonomy of the alliance from Chinese interference. And let's be blunt about this. The Chinese are engaged in industrial levels of industrial uh, and other forms of espionage across the West. Um, they uh, uh, are seeking to influence states and their choices, possibly NATO and EU states, through debt diplomacy, which we must counter. They control many of the rare earth metals, which are vital to many of the components of our uh, future uh, uh, techno technologically based defense, which we need to kind of counter. So, and we need to build, as James suggests, build our own 5 and 6G. So, uh, we have to be a competitor with China. Uh, a strategic competitor with China and compete both Europeans and North Americans um, without emnifying China, be under no illusions about the nature of China itself. It's, it's a control freak. It wants to control its environment and will use all the means available to it to so do. And, and we've, got to be, we've got to identify its policies, its methods, 
and counter them uh, um, without necessarily turning it into a renewed Cold War. Imminent? Uh, Lauren, do you want to chip in on anything on, on this? Okay. Okay. Any uh, further questions from uh, the audience? Can't see anything. Ah, yes. Thank you. I'm Alexey Melnik from Kyiv, Ukraine, okay, Razumko Center. And uh, we've been talking about conventional threats and Article 5 as the, the strongest argument by NATO. And at the same time, it seems like conventional threats become less and less conventional. So do you expect that in the new strategic concepts we'll see some elaboration or some kind of uh, amendments to the Article 5 regarding, for instance, legal definitions for the acts of aggression mm. Uh, mm. by cyber, yeah. information, yeah. energy, private military yeah. companies. It's a very important thing. question, actually, <laughs> and uh, this whole grey area. And I think s the uh, NATO has already started addressing these issues in some of their declarations, but let, let my colleagues, uh, James, uh, answer that. So I, I, I think that's an excellent question. Uh, Article 5, as you know, is quite vague. Uh, and it's deliberately vague, meaning it's deliberately flexible. Uh, and I think any effort to further define exactly within Article 5 what thresholds are is unwise and unnecessary. Uh, but you're quite right that it needs to cover what are new uh, environments for uh, conflict. Uh, one is cyberspace, and the Allies have already been clear that uh, a cyber attack can reach the threshold where consideration of Article 5 uh, would be on the table. I think threats to the space environment now are potentially on the table when it comes to Article 5. Uh, so I, I think any potential adversary uh, needs to know that in the end it's a judgment call, and uh, it won't be restricted to the traditional perspectives and obviously the one time Article 5 has been uh, invoked was when terrorists flew airplanes uh, into into the United States. Uh, we could have never predicted that and had anyone tried to define what Article 5's parameters were, that wouldn't have been in. So it would have been a mistake to define those parameters. I mean, I think uh, just to, to press on this, uh, uh, there were certainly, uh, uh, there was mention of uh, either Poland, Latvia, Lithuania, uh, seeking uh, Article 4 consultations, which in turn, I mean, in many ways, uh, you could describe what's happening on the border of Poland uh, as an attack on a member state. But presumably it's the prerogative of each of the member states to decide whether, you know, they, they go for a consultation under Article 4 or whether they perceive it as being an attack. Absolutely. I mean, Article 4 is definitely a strong political signal because we have consultations, as you know very well, every day at NATO. And we have had extensive consultations on the situation on the border uh, with, with Belarus in, in the last few, few weeks and months. So there's no doubt that consultations are taking place. But to do it under Article 4 is to send a strong political signal that the Allies wish to raise the level of alert, mm. raise the level of political attention, that this is getting more serious. But there is no automaticity between Article 4 and Article 5. Uh, so I, I don't think we should presume that either. Um, the military tool, which is of course NATO's strongest tool, is one which you have to deploy with care. I'm not 100% convinced that it's the first and foremost tool that allies have been or wish to see applied with regard to forced weaponization of migration or migrants. Mm -hmm. If you look at the way in which allies have been dealing with um, this situation, they very much have had civilian personnel yeah. up front with military behind to provide support uh, because a military tool is not best for everything. But Article 4 is, of course, something at their disposal if they wish to invoke it, which has not yet been the case. Lauren. Yeah, I think this is a, 
a really critical question because I think we're seeing ourselves in an environment now where sub-threshold threats, meaning below Article 5, are increasingly part of collective defense. And um, it's not just this clear-cut, you know, conventional or non-conventional that they, they, of course, blend together. And I think NATO needs to be active in both sorts of, of realms, um, including below the threshold. And, and, of course, that response may not be uh, military tools, but I think it's important to remember that NATO can also be a platform for nations to coordinate actions that might be non-military responses to uh, sub-threshold threats, whether those are things like sanctions or, or diplomatic initiatives. Um, even if NATO is not the sole actor implementing, it can be the table to organize those responses. Um, and I think we also, because the, the, the threshold of Article 5 is so purposefully vague, and, and I agree with James's point on this, um, I think we need to do a better job of testing our own assumptions and our own thinking about uh, what those thresholds look like among different nations. And so that means more exercising with kind of tougher scenarios that have uh, different kinds of innovative scenarios and, and really push ourselves to talk about this in a closed door setting internally. So that way we can figure out what our possible response options are and socialize them ahead of time um, so that when the shoe drops, you know, we're, we're ready with, with what we can do as nations and how NATO can play a coordinating role in that. And then the final point I would just add is that I think a lot of these sub-threshold actions, you know, they're already very clearly happening around us and they're not just one-off incidents. They are parts of uh, widespread, organized, ongoing, continuous campaigns orchestrated by Russia and China against the Transatlantic Alliance. And so I think we have to be cognizant that, you know, a certain level of, of harm has already been done. So there is, there is uh, an opening there for, for us as nations and the alliance to do some things as countermeasures, um, obviously very carefully and calculated uh, and proportionately, but, but just I think we need to think more proactively. Someone raised the, the issue of going beyond resilience as deterrence by denial, maybe to something closer to deterrence by punishment in some specific cases. So I think that's definitely something we should be thinking and talking about as allies and partners. Well, just to follow on from that, because uh, in, in the press conference with uh, the Secretary General and uh, the President of the Commission, Latvia's uh, uh, Prime Minister earlier this week uh, uh, focused on the information war and the way this is, uh, you know, uh, being perceived as a, a current hybrid, uh, part of the hybrid attacks that are taking place. Uh, what do you see as the tools that are at NATO's disposal for dealing with with the uh, you know strategic communication issues and the, the 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 information war aspects of hybrid attacks, James. Uh, yeah, it's a great question and a huge question. So let me say, yesterday I just visited the Center of Excellence mm. here in Latvia on strategic communications. It is extremely impressive. Uh, the analysis uh, that they do on a daily basis. It's also deeply worrying when you see what conclusions they come to. But I think there's a few things we can do. One is uh, having a comprehensive picture and analysis of the range of uh, strategic communication attacks uh, on us and, and how they fit into the larger strategy of adversaries. And that's what this center does, it's what all allies are doing. Uh, second is uh, rapid rebuttal of disinformation. We do that at NATO. Third is working closely with the European Union to do exactly the same thing sharing the threat picture, responding quickly. We do that as well, and my colleagues uh, here do that on a daily basis. Um, the fourth thing is that allies need to take steps. And in the end, NATO cannot secure the information space of all allies. But those steps include educating journalists to know what's real and what's not real, educating students to know what's real and not real. So my kids, sorry, keep bringing them up, but they get taught in school on a monthly basis they get a class, this is how you can tell what's real and not real. Check the URL, check it against something else. So they learn what is disinformation, what's not, uh, and pump out truth. Uh, we're not going to try to pump disinformation into Russia. That's not how we do things, but we do need to provide truth. The problem is, of course, as we all know, that people are bombarded with so much information that the problem isn't that they buy the opponent's story. The problem is that they don't know what's true anymore. Uh, so when uh, the airliner got shot down over Ukraine, Russia put out, I think the number was 34 different explanations for what had happened. They weren't trying to sell one. They were just trying to make it 
impossible to know which one was true, the one that we sent out or the one that they sent out. So uh, this is really not an easy job, but you know, I'm quite reassured by what happened here in the Baltic states uh, a few years ago when Russia put out the story that I think it was German forces had uh, raped a girl. It was not true. Lithuania. And Lithuania, and very quickly, I mean within hours, this story had been debunked. People did not buy it, uh, and it failed. And, and I think that we do have a higher level of resilience now in many ways than we did a few years ago. We're less naive. Um, I think the biggest challenge is social media, and that relates very much to EU regulation, national regulation, and NATO really can't do much about that. Okay, thanks. Uh, Lauren, do you want to add on that? Okay, I'll let the other speakers um, I know that uh, Benoit wanted to just very briefly comment, yes, and then perhaps uh, Julian. We are seeing the sub-threshold uh, threat um, is, um, is linked also to the capacity uh, to identify uh, the culprit and uh, to convince the ally uh, of, uh, of uh, the origin of the threat. Uh, in the cyber uh, area and in space, uh, sometimes the identification is not easy or not quick. And uh, I think that NATO is a good place for exchanging uh, information about uh, those, uh, those aspects. Uh, it's needed some investment, uh, for example, for space uh, uh, watching. Uh, and also, uh, there are political ways to deal with it. Uh, I am struck, for example, that the Biden-Putin uh, conversation uh, mentioned red line uh, on, on cyber attack. Uh, and uh, that was uh, informal, not, uh, leg not uh, legally binding, but uh, it was uh, a signal that the importance uh, of uh, that the U.S. attached to some uh, infrastructure saying to, to Putin, don't play with that. And I think it's, a, it's, it's something which uh, uh, is uh, linked with a kind of uh, uh, deterrence uh, that we should uh, develop uh, into NATO. Okay, thanks for coming in on the cyber. Julian, uh, any quick comments? Unmute, please. Yep, yeah, I've unmuted it, but I've, I keep being muted by your end. Um, oh. Look, grey zone warfare is with us. Uh, we are involved in a kind of perma warfare. And we're going to have to have um, a tailored deterrence in a sense, because, uh, you know, some of this stuff, whether it's cyber or information warfare, can do great damage. And we're going to have to focus on, on acts, effects, and outcomes. And it might take some time to identify the perpetrator, but we will. And when we do, we have to be proportionate and consistent in our response as part of deterrence. Deterrence must be vague because there has to be uncertainty on the part of the aggressor about our response, but it must also be credible. And for example, when there was uh, the attack in Salisbury, the use of Novichok nerve agent by the GRU in a situation which could have killed significant numbers of British citizens. Yes, that was an act that was at worst, best foolhardy at worst, a grey zone warfare. Um, to my mind, it was a grave act. We, uh, we, we took out sanctions for a time and then quickly dumped them. And I do think that any uh, uh, potential adversary who thinks that if they carry out grey zone warfare, which can be very intense, uh, but not wholly destructive, unless we demonstrate to them that we are consistent in the nature of our response, and that we will not quickly dump it because of more narrow interests, uh, then I'm afraid that, that any attempt to stop this will fail. So I, I, I do accept that we're going to have to reconceive of deterrence in this new environment, but also reconceive of our response to it as well. Imans? Hey, thanks. Thanks very much, Julian. We've got uh, about five minutes left. Uh, um, so uh, I see there's a question there. And... Uh, Perhaps we'll take the second one uh, immediately afterwards. Hi, uh, my name is Luka Zalokar and I come from Slovenia. I, I'm a PhD student at the University of Ljubljana. And my question is uh, uh, to Laurent and James. And 
since the importance of the private sector is growing more important uh, in order to address the con contemporary challenges, uh, my question is, what are some of the issues when it comes to NATO cooperating with, for example, technology companies? Are these only financial in nature, or does it also boil down to values or problem perception or something similar? Thank you. Thanks very much. And over here. Hi. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Thomas Pildegovic. I'm a PhD candidate at uh, Cambridge University. I have a question for Mr. Lindley French in particular. Could you name one black swan or unexpected security risk and one gray rhino or present but ignored security risk that the international community should look out for? Thank you. Somebody has been reading uh, <laughs> Julian Lingley French's articles, I think. <laughs> but let's uh, take the first question and, and then we'll round off with Julian. Uh, James? So, great question on the private sector. Uh, very quickly, I, I would say it's crucial because 30 years ago, government was driving innovation. Government owned the strategic critical infrastructure or could control it if it needed to, from the railroads to the ports. Now, private sector runs the critical infrastructure, including the cyber infrastructure, and leads on the innovation and has you know, multi multiple amounts of money. So, great question. Uh, when it comes to traditional defense industry, that cooperation is there, it's fine. But tech companies, they don't think about defense issues, that's the first thing. So there's an education job to be done. Uh, second, they don't need uh, government, sorry about that, government money. Uh, so there's uh, an incentive that we need to provide to have them work with us. Uh, and third, there's a culture problem uh, that many tech companies lean away from defense thinking that it's unethical to work with defense. So we need to communicate with them in that regard. And I'd say there's two points. One is we need to have ethical guidelines for the new technology. So we have just published at NATO uh, guidelines for the ethical use of artificial intelligence. Mm. And one of the reasons we did that and agree agreed them amongst the 30 allies and then published it is so that companies that wish to work with us know that we will follow ethical guidelines. The flip side of that coin in the second point, and that I'll stop, is I think we need to educate tech companies that when they are selling to China, when they are selling to Russia, when they are selling to autocratic regimes, when they are selling their technology or letting it be acquired through venture capital funds, what do they think is being done with that tech? Uh, companies from my country, from the United States, and I'm sure across Europe, have sell, sold surveillance technology to autocratic regimes. And they don't seem to have a problem doing that, but they have a problem working with the defense industry in democratic governments that follow guidelines. I don't really accept this way of doing business. So there's a little bit of deliberate not willing to know to, in order to make money, and we need to be firm about that as well. Lauren? Um, absolutely. I love this issue because I think working with uh, the private sector is so important um, and completely footstomp everything that James just said. Um, in terms of how do we do better cooperation, I think uh, step one is bringing industry representatives to the table more often, including uh, non-traditional industry partners, you know, not just the traditional defense companies, but the startups and others. Um, they often uh, have real-time information because they do run the critical infrastructure and other things that can help us, even inside NATO, kind of understand the threat uh, in a better, more effective way. So. I think we need to do more kind of listening as well as uh, you know, sharing our, our feedback. And I think there's a hesitancy sometimes to kind of talk at uh, rather than, than hear from. So making sure that that's a two-way channel. Um, I also think we can collaborate more on talent. I mean, there is a huge talent gap inside uh, our governments and our institutions, especially on tech talent. So working closely with the private sector to facilitate exchange that way uh, is more that we can do. And then, of course, uh, as James said, kind of this, uh, it's a cultural issue, but it's also kind of a, a legal contractual issue. It's the way of doing business is different. So we need to improve our structures to be able to work faster, to have shorter project timelines um, so that we can we can work more efficiently and, and make it a little bit more, more feasible and profitable uh, for these types of companies to work with governments and NATO. Thank you, Lauren. Julian, you've got uh, yeah. half, a, half a minute on swans and elephants. 
Well, I'm not sure I should be, be talking to a Cambridge man anyway. Um, <laughs> black swans are unpredictable events with severe consequences. Well, we're living right in the middle of one, COVID. Um, the reason I can't be with you today because of Dutch travel laws. Um, a grey rhino event is a possible, probable but event that's ignored. And I would argue in Western Europe in particular, that is the possibility of a conventional war in Europe. Um, it's uh, certainly more probable than it was, or possible than it was, but I think much of Western Europe is in denial about the possibility of it, which is under undermining the credibility of NATO deterrence. If NATO has a crisis point, it's in Western Europe, uh, not in North America, nor in Eastern Europe. Immens? For reminding us that uh, conventional war is still on the agenda and that, uh, you know, here we're very focused on issues of uh, collective defence, deterrence, and uh, looking forward to what the uh, uh, new strategic concept of NATO will bring us next June at the, uh, uh, the summit in Madrid. And uh, thank you, all four of you, for sharing your views on uh, these, these issues and uh, how emerging technologies and emerging threats will knock into to what we can expect uh, in, in the next uh, few months. So can I just uh, invite uh, uh, everybody to uh, express our thanks to our four panelists for being with us today and uh, announce that on a technical level, we have uh, a lunch upstairs on the, on the uh, first floor. And please uh, be back for 2.30. And once again, thank you all of you for, for participating today. Thanks very much. Thank